you have little faith. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after the, all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Andy and I are trying to preach the same sermon. I, I'm, I don't know that we're on the same boat yet. I just... I checked with him on Wednesday night or Wednesday afternoon. I think we're preaching the same thing tonight. But anyway, so it's preaching out of Matthew. It's one of the it's one of the ten, top ten verses that have been Googled on the internet, and people have, have read them. and And uh, so I just, they we decided that would be a good sun, Sunday night series for uh, the summer. And it's Matthew six thirty three and thirty four. The title of my message tonight is. <clears throat> Have I got a deal for you? Do I sound like a car salesman yet? Have I got a deal for you? Man, this is something you, listen, you can't pass this up. That, it's going to, it'll take a while to get to it. All right. I want you to notice, first of all, that this is a passage of scripture that's found in the, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. Five, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7 of Matthew is all about the Sermon on the Mount. You can read that, and I encourage you to read it, but you're not going to find anything in there about salvation. Jesus isn't talking to those people about being saved. He's not talking to those people about the cross. He's not talking to those people about the blood of Christ. He is giving them the law of the kingdom. He is taking people who have been schooled in the, New, in the Old Testament law, the, the Ten Commandments, and, the, and all of the 600 plus uh, additions to that law done by the, fa the uh, fathers of the faithful. He is taking them and he's now giving them his nuance to that law. It is not to get you saved. When I hear people say to me, well, I'm just trying to live by the, by the, by the Sermon on the Mount. Well, good luck. Because if you, you can live by the Sermon on the Mount all you want to and you'll go flat to hell. If you don't receive Christ as your Savior, you don't make it. If you're not born from above, you don't make it. Now, the good thing is, how many can be born from above? Everybody. But if you're, I, I heard President Obama say this. I became, he said, I, I became a Christian when I read the Sermon on the Mount and realized what a great moral and ethical um, treatise it was. And that's, what, uh, that's why I became a Christian. No. No, that doesn't make you a Christian any more than driving into a, walking into a garage makes you an Oldsmobile. It doesn't do it. But what he's trying to do in these three chapters indeed, and in this particular passage of Scripture, what he's trying to do is he's trying to say, this is the law of the kingdom. This is what the kingdom is going to be like. Now, look, folks, if you want to wait until you get there to start living, that's fine. Be my guest. You're cheating yourself. Because he's saying to us, if this is the law of the kingdom, if this is how we're going to live in heaven, wouldn't it be wonderful to live like that here? I mean, if heaven's going to be perfect, then this, is, this should be great. You know, as C.H. Spurgeon said, a little bit of faith will get you into heaven. A whole lot of faith will get heaven into you. And that's what we need is a lot of heaven in us. That's what I need. I don't know what you need. But I think, I think my needs are pretty much what everybody else's needs are as far as, as far as humanity is concerned. So I want you to understand, first of all, this is not about salvation. Listen, if you are saved, you are saved by the blood of the crucified one. You are saved because you, you received Jesus as your personal Savior. You are saved because you accepted his death, burial, and resurrection as payment for your sin. You are saved because you look forward to his, close, his, his soon return for his church. You are saved because you have a relationship. You have been born from above with, from the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you are saved, period, end of sentence, exclamation point. Can I get an amen? amen? 
That's what I'm, that, so don't confuse what I'm going to say with salvation. I'm not judging anybody's salvation. Okay? All right. Four points I want you to get out of this passage of Scripture. Look at it again. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I have four words. The first one is this, which, this passage of Scripture speaks to me of choices. I can't get away from it. There are choices that we're going to make in life. How many of you know you made one tonight before you came here? Amen? Amen. Uh, it's unfortunate that the 120 others didn't make the same choice. But I'm not judging their salvation. It's a choice. And folks, choices have consequences. Adrian Rogers, oh, Adrian Rogers was a great pastor of, of Bellevue Church in Memphis, Tennessee for years and years and years. He made this comment, and I've never forgotten it. We can make our choices, but we can't choose our consequences. Once the choice has been made, the consequences are in effect. Once in a while, God comes in in a marvelous and delivering way and delivers us from the consequences. But boy, I'm going to tell you, most of the time, he doesn't. The consequences are going to be there. And the fact that he doesn't pay on Friday doesn't mean that the consequences aren't going to follow you. I'm sorry. By the way, how many are glad he doesn't pay on Friday? I need a lot of mercy, man. I mean to tell you. We make choices, and we make them. Now, the church, people who are born again, make the choices too. Our choice is not the way. The, the choice of the world is, is this. Is this, I, I'm going to do this good, and this is evil. So i got to make a choice between good and evil. Now, if evil is going to bring me more money, I'm going to choose evil. <laughs> I, I, isn't that the way the world thinks? If evil is going to bring, bring me more power, then I'll choose evil. I don't know what good does for me, but if I'm, maybe I'm going to feel good just by doing good. So I'll do good and that'll be okay. The world just chooses between good and evil. For the church, we are supposed to be overwhelmed and indwelled, indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? So our choice is not between good and evil. We know what evil is. And we know it's not good. <laughs> we know it. That's what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do. You know what our choices are? <laughs> Between good, better, and best. That's the nuance. The choice is between good, better, and best. And I was raised in politics, as most of you know, or many of you know. And one thing I scream at the television set an awful lot when, when I'm watching uh, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm reduced now to watching uh, old comedies, The Lone Ranger, and, um, and baseball, and that's it. But, but uh, when I happen to get on the news, and I'm listening to this senator and this representative, and, this, and they're talking back and forth and all the rest of it, and I'm not going to vote for that, and, and the, I don't see how you can't vote for this, and all the rest of it. And I want to say to them, listen, in politics, we had an old rule, and that is, don't ever let the best be the enemy of the good. Meaning that when you're dealing in politics with people, you got to understand that sometimes, not sometimes, hardly ever do you get the perfect storm where everything's perfect. Before. You're not going to vote for that. Yeah. I mean, you're never going to see it. So what you're going to have to do is take half a loaf instead of a full one. It's called compromise. In politics, it's not a bad thing. In churches, it's a terrible thing, but that's another thing. We let the good be the enemy of the better so many times. In other words, we will say, well, it would be better if I did this, but it, oh man, that requires a little too much of my time, my energy, my effort. That requires a little too much of me, so what I'll do is I'll just do the good. The better looks so good, but I, yeah, the best would be, boy, can you imagine? Maybe if we did this, the church would really explode in growth and all the rest, but it would require that, mm, it might require that I have to be faithful in attending the church services, all of them. Well, I don't want that. 
It might require me to tithe. It might require me to to, uh, pray a little more. It might, oh my, it might require me to get rid of my tribalism. You know what tribalism is? Tribalism is where the preacher can talk about anybody and anybody except my family. <laughs> Even though my family may be lousy with sin and may be doing things that are terrible, they can't. They, I'm part of the tribe, and so the preacher can't say anything about it. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. The Holy Spirit can. Thank you. Two people over here are with me. So we're just going to preach to you. Um, the Holy Spirit knows who's doing the... <laughs> who's putting the monkey wrench in the plans. So what I'm saying to you is that our, if we want to live the law of the kingdom, we better start making choices that are best. And the choices that are best are always going to require lots and lots and lots from us. I heard it said today, and it's very, very, very true, I think, that people, and I think I've already quoted it, people People who don't realize the sacrifice that was made for freedom will let it go without a fight. I'm afraid that's where we are in so many cases with our, well, with our educational system, for example, that refuses to teach our history. But I'm going to tell you something. It, it applies to the church as well. If the church is going to be what the church is supposed to be, it's going to be because we have made the choice to follow the best route instead of the good route. And it may require us to say to our own families, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. I'm sorry, but I can't live like that because I want the best. I want the best. It's a choice. We all have the choices. Have I got a deal for you? I want you to make the best choice. You know why? Because there's a promise coming. Look at the second thing. I think this passage of Scripture uh, says to me, not only do we have choices, but there's a priority involved. A priority involved. Seek ye what? First, I've never understood why that is such a problem for people. First, but I taught for 33 years and I watched it be a problem to students for 33 years. I had this, I never will forget, I had a kid that had, there were three brothers in the family. The oldest one and the youngest one were all, they were nice kids and I liked them all. But, you know, they were just nice kids in class. They didn't cause any trouble. Boy, that middle one was a mess. He had the most beautiful eyes you ever saw in your life. And I'm not, I'm not homosexual, so don't worry about it. But I mean, they were, they were gorgeous eyes. And um, he wasn't then. He, had a, he was, uh, you know, a nice, had a nice torso and the whole business. And I guess for the better part of 11 years, that had gotten him through school. He comes into my class, and he wants to brown nose me, and I just never did take to that much, you know. I told him, don't try that on me unless you bring some chocolate chip cookies and some Pepsis. That works, but the other stuff doesn't. Well, at the end of the first, at the end of the first quarter, I sent him, I gave him a D minus, and I'm telling you, it was a gift. Yeah, I mean it. I felt, like the, I felt like handing a paper back, just a blank piece of paper, this is your grade, and having a mark at the top and the bottom, at the, every corner there'd be a mark, a diagonal mark, and having him come up and say, what's that mean? I said, zero too big for the paper. Boy, he was a zero. And, uh, and uh, so he said, well, I'll do better. Well, he didn't. I mean, he expected his good looks to carry him. At the end, about halfway through the second quarter, I sent him a a notice that said, if you don't, if your grades don't improve, you're going to fail this semester. You fail the semester, you fail the year. You don't get a chance to make it up. First semester, I mean, I said, you might as well stay out. 
Well, he came in the next day after he got that uh, uh, notice at home, and he says, I didn't have any idea I was doing that poorly. I said, let me show you my grade book. And after he added, uh, he added up all the grades, uh, which got him into just barely double digits, um, he decided that probably he was going to get an F. And I told him, I said, now, if you will go home. I said, I don't, want, I don't like to funk anybody. I didn't like to funk anybody. I said, you go home and you do this work. I gave him a, a list of homework to do. And I said, get that to me by one week from today, and I'll, I'll make sure that I rescind that notice. Oh, I'll do it, Mr. Gattle, I'll do it. Well, he happened to be a member of First Baptist Church in um, Columbus. And he went every Sunday. I knew he did. And so uh, that was on a Wednesday. On Friday, he came in. And I said, uh, Brian, you got that work done? Uh, no, not yet. I'm, I'm going to do it this weekend. Yeah. So... Um, Monday morning came, and he came walking in. I said, uh, that stuff should be on my desk. And he said, you know, Mr. Gettle, I just didn't have a chance to do it over the weekend. Uh, we had uh, special services at the church, and, and I had to be there for the special services at the church. And I said, well, you know, it has to be there by Wednesday. And so Wednesday morning I came in. It wasn't on my desk. And so he came into class, and I said, now, Brian, I, there's nothing, there hadn't been anything on my desk. And he says, you know, Mr. Gettle, he says, we're having revival at our church. And I just had to go to the revival. But he said, I can tell you all the names of the good kings of Israel. <laughs> yeah, all right. Anybody know how many good kings Israel had? Zero. <laughs> I don't know what he was thinking. <laughs> And I looked at him and I said, Brian, are you aware of the fact that knowing the, all the good kings of Israel is not what I asked for? And then he said, but it's not important what you're asking for. That's the end of that. I looked at him and I said, what's the most important thing you've got to do this year? He said, I don't know. I said, it's graduate. You don't have anything more important than graduation as far as this year is concerned. And you're not making it. That's priority. I want to tell you something, folks. We fight priority. We don't like to put first things first. We like to put what we want first. And when the scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, this is not a request. This is an imperative. For salvation? No. Seek ye first the kingdom of God for your good life. That's what he's talking about here. You want to get rid of worry. You want to get rid of worry about what the tomorrow is going to bring. You want to get rid of worry about how you're going to pay for this. You want to get rid of worry about where you're going to live and all the rest of it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. When it starts bugging you, when the world starts moving in on you, you simply sit back and you sit down and you say, God, what do you want me to do? And you don't move until he tells you. And he'll tell you that's what the Holy Spirit's for. But don't come to me and tell me, I can't understand. I'm not getting anything from God. I, all the blessings I see other people get, I'm not getting any of it. And I never see you at church. I never see, whenever I hear you, all I hear is about how this is bad and that is bad. And, and how this, the people did this to you and people did that to you. I never hear you tell me about how wonderful the Lord has been. I never hear you tell me about something that God has said new to you. I never hear, never hear you tell me something about, hey, you know what? When I heard you preach or when I heard Andy preach or I heard somebody on the radio preach and it said something to me, it just, it just grabbed me and I'm telling you my life is going to be different and my behavior is going to be different. But I'm going to tell you, folks, your job is not first. 
Come on. Can I tell you something else? Your family is not first. Money is not first. If we're going to live the kingdom life, and if you get the deal that I've got for you, you've got to do what? You've got to put him first. What he wants. Not what I want, what he wants. I don't know. Where does God want you on Sunday morning? I don't have any problem with that. Where does God want you on Sunday night? Where does God want you on Wednesday night? Where does God want you? What does God want you to do with your first, the first ten percent of what you earn? I mean, he's tell, he tells you. He tells you this is what's got to be first. And if it's something else, well, good luck with it. I can't give you much of a deal because I'm getting to the deal. The first is choice. The second is priorities. And the third thing I want to call to your attention is the expectation. Ah, here's, now here's the deal, folks, the expectation. Are you ready for it? Here's the deal. He says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, look, theologians argue and argue and argue about this passage of Scripture all the time. Well, the big argument is this. What does he mean by all things? All these things. Some theologians say, well, he's talking about worry. He's talking about clothes. He's talking about food. He's talking about shelter uh, in, the pa in, the, in the previous verses. So he's talk that's all he means is that if you put Jesus first, you put Jesus first, these things will, you'll have enough. You know what? Others will say, nope, God's storehouse of things covers entire, the entire universe. He has everything under his control. If you want good things in your life in every direction, put Jesus first. You know what? It doesn't bother me either way. Except for the fact that I'm going to absolutely have an expectation that he's going to do it. Hebrews 11:6. which we're teaching that on, we went through that on, on Wednesday night. For those of you who weren't here, we went through that on Wednesday night. You know what Hebrews 11:6 6 says? He that cometh unto me must believe that I am and that I am a rewarder of them who diligently seek me. Now, I am not part of the blab it and grab it crew. I'm not part of the name it and claim it. I'm not part of the possess it, profess it and possess it, but I will tell you this. I don't see any problem of us looking at this passage of Scripture square in the face and saying, that's God's promise to me and I'm going to live on it. I have to tell you the opposite of the promises there as well. If you choose not to do it, if you make the choice not to do it, you're going to suffer those consequences as well. And when and if you believe this, if you believe if you believe that seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you, if you believe that, then you have to believe the opposite of it too. You have to be the logical extension of it. You have to believe that. And the logical extension is if you don't seek first the kingdom of God, these things will not be added to you. And that's tough preaching. <laughs> that's also tough listening. I understand. If you don't seek him first, then those, the promises of seeking him first aren't coming to you. And man, I have seen that to the point that it almost makes me sick. I could give you chapter and verse of being on the staff out here for 18 years, 17 years, excuse me, 17 years plus. And I could give you chapter and verse of families that I have seen who have come in and who have, who have, why, man, I remember, I remember one, one young lady 
and she started coming to Wednesday night services. She started coming to Sunday night services. She was here for the Sunday morning services. She had a family. Yeah, I don't think everything was perfect in the family, but it was, it, it was, I mean, the kids were with her. And, the, and they were smiling. And the family was happy. She dropped out. She dropped out of Wednesday night. Guess what's the next thing? Sunday night. She's not here tonight. Still a member of this church. If I could, I'm not at liberty to tell you, but if I could tell you the disaster that's fallen on that family as far as an interfamily relationships are concerned, I, every time I see the woman, she starts crying about what's going on in her family. And I want to say, Matthew 6, 33. If you don't put him first, I believe your families will suffer. If you don't put him first, I believe your job will suffer. If you don't put him first, I know your relationships are going to suffer. And first is so easy. Well, I say it's easy. So what's the first thing you ought to do? I'm telling you, folks, the first thing you ought to do is get saved. Amen. What's the first thing you do after you get saved? Anybody know? You follow the Lord and believers' baptism. That's the first thing you do after you get saved. Then, and that's the confession of Christ in publicly. You, Father, you don't get baptized in order to be saved. Oh, for goodness sake, can we get rid of that Arminianism once and for all? You get baptized because you are saved. And you want a good confession before God. Then what do you do? Anybody know what's the next step? But I, they're not in any particular order. Start reading the scripture, sure. Start praying, sure. Tell other people about Jesus, sure. Be in church, sure. Goodness gracious, can you imagine? Well, why don't you come to my church? Well, I, you're talking to your neighbor. Why don't you come to my church? Well, uh, um, is it a good church? Yes, it is. Then why don't you go? Talk about hypocrisy. They spotted it right off, didn't they? Strange, strange. Jesus first means Jesus first. I don't have any other way to talk about that. It means Jesus first. Years ago, 1954, a young preacher left Springfield, Missouri and went to Virginia. I've told, I've told this story so many times, and some of you have heard it so many times that you're probably going to... But don't, don't, don't put it away from you yet. Just, just stay with me. He went to Lynchburg, Virginia, and he started a church with 35 members that were cast off from, his, from, a, from a local congregation there. At the end of the first year, after he started with 35 adult members, at the end of the first year, they had a, 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 a first year anniversary of his pastor there. They had 800 and some odd people in church. That's a pretty good growth rate. About uh, five years, maybe six years after he was pastor there, they were up in the 2000s at that time, and he started a little program. And I, I, I remember the program. Uh, he, he got a little pen. A little pen, about like that. I, was, I should have brought that tonight. A little pen. Uh, and if you, have, if you had ever sent a, a prayer request into that church, or if you had ever sent any money into that church, he would send you two of those little pens. They were bronze pens, and they just had on it, Jesus first. He called them his Jesus first lapel pen. Man, that thing went all over this world like like. Like especially in the United States, like wildfire. And if if uh, you were if you were a contributor to their um, um, to their uh, presentation on TV, he would send you a gold-plated one. That church was up to six thousand within a year after after he started that program. He just didn't, you know, he wanted them to win it, wear it on their lapel. He wanted to work, to work. 
Can you imagine? So that people said, well, what's the pen about? They could do what? Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He said he, he was picked up. Um, when Jimmy Carter became president, he didn't support Carter for, <laughs> for the presidency, but um, Carter wanted to make, make nice with him. So he called him, along with several other preachers, to the White House. He said he got to the White House, and he drove up to the White House in this limousine and all the rest of that, and he said, a Secret Service man. Yeah, I mean, how many of you have seen Secret Service men? I mean, they're, you know, they're like Ombre Montana. And um, um, uh, he came out in you know, dark suits and the, the earphone and all the rest of it, and he said he opened up the door, and he said, I got out, and he said, we walked in. Not a smile by that guy. Nothing. Just said we got in and the man turned around and looked at me and said can I can I see you over here in this um, area over here and so Paul said oh my stars what did I do now so he walked over there with him and the man looked at him and said I just wanted to show you something and he opened up his lapel and there was the Jesus first pen and he started to weep this big secret service man Tears in his eyes, and he says, somebody told me about Jesus. I'm telling you, folks, we put Jesus first in this church. Things will happen. Now we have a choice. We can go for the good. The good is what we've always been doing. We can go for the better. Or we can put every program, every sermon, every worship service, every song, we can put them under the microscope, and the microscope is Jesus first. We can put all of our motivations under that same thing, Jesus first. We can put all of our attendance under that same thing, Jesus first. Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, we can put our tithe, Jesus first. We can put our witness, Jesus first. And all these things shall be added unto you. Have I got a deal for you? First time I heard that from an automobile salesman, I actually believed him. <laughs> but you know what? The truth is this. I couldn't get the deal until I chose it. I put my name on the contract. You can't get the deal to say, oh, yeah, God, that's, that's a fine sermon. Well, maybe it wasn't a fine sermon. It, it, I didn't like it. Hey, I'm telling you something, folks. I want the best for people. That's the only reason I ever started preaching. I wanted the best for people. Number one, the best is to get saved. Amen. Number two, the best is to live like Jesus wants me to live. And all my job is to tell you what the scripture says. Every head bowed, please. Every eye closed. If you're here this evening and you've never been saved, tonight's the night. Don't waste any time about it. If you're here this morning, this evening, and you've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism, tonight's the night. We know how to do it without embarrassment to anybody, and it would be a great service. If you're here tonight and you know that you haven't been putting Jesus first in your business, you've not been putting Jesus first in your attendance, you've not been cheap putting Jesus first in your finances, tonight's the night to do something about it. Some of you may want to do something at these prayer altars up here, and that's what we've got them for. Some of you may decide to do that in your church, in your, right there in your pew. But as the Holy Spirit speaks to you, I pray that you will. Now, don't turn him off. All he's trying to do is to get you to live a better life, the best life, with Jesus first. 
Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we ask now for your Holy Spirit to move in this congregation in and out these pews and up and down these aisles and speak to people's hearts. Let them make the decision tonight that needs to be made and let them live by that decision, dear Heavenly Father. Give them the grace and the mercy to do it. And we pray it in Jesus' name, our hymn of invitation.